As a physician, I work at the University of California, San Francisco, as well as villages in rural, in rural Rwanda and rural India. I have come to believe that needless deaths, deaths from treatable diseases, start where narratives go unheard. Whose suffering matters less and why? I grapple with this question in my work every day, but it was seeded into my consciousness many years ago. Before I was a doctor, I was a poet. Tell them I stood side by side, the doctors and the dreamers, a poem in my left hand and a scalpel in my right. Tried and tried to funnel lilies and light from poems into the tip of my scalpel. Cut a slice of bread for the hungry. I wrote this poem at 19 as an idealistic undergrad at UC Berkeley. But the themes that run through it continue to shape my path to this day. What does it mean to be a doctor in this unequal world? What is the power of narrative to impact the healthcare we provide? And how do the stories we tell and the stories we don't have deep implications in healthcare? I became a first time father this past summer. Our daughter's middle name is June. Now, June is an unusual name for Indian folks. <laughs> Many of our family members thought she was named after her birth month. But our daughter was actually named after June Jordan, the African-American UC Berkeley professor and one of the most published poets in history. I started writing poetry in June's classroom. June was always asking in her class whose suffering matters less and why. I remember her holding up a photo in the newspaper of flood victims from Bangladesh. There was a photo with a caption, but no story. Whose suffering matters less and why? Our job as poets in June's class was to write something beautiful, but it was more. It was to take risks. It was to write about something or someone in a way that would make the reader stop and listen. It was to stand by the side of the silenced and tell the truth. We can practice medicine in that same spirit. We can figure out who are dying from treatable diseases, seek out those suffering needlessly, and stand by their side, commit to their care. After graduating Berkeley, I moved to New York. My first year in medical school was the last year of June's life. June was undergoing chemo and radiation for breast cancer. I was poring over medical text. We began to talk twice a week. In some ways, she was my first patient. June had lived an incredible life. She had a laugh that could sing in your head for hours. She was a tremendous listener that could make you feel like what you had to say was terribly valuable. She had worked side by side with Malcolm X. She had registered black voters against the threat of severe violence in the Deep South. And she had reimagined and redesigned Harlem with city planners and scientists. Mixed in with these incredible stories was the more difficult narrative of her medical care. June sometimes felt talked down to by her medical team. She sometimes felt erased by the health system. At the end of June's life, her brilliant career, her financial security, her literary gifts were not enough to shield her from the challenges we know most black women with breast cancer face. Did her suffering matter less than others? By all the data we have, it did. 
Black women have breast cancer outcomes that mirror that of white women in the 1970s. They are diagnosed later, don't have access to care as often, and even when diagnosed, don't receive recommended treatments. A congressionally mandated study in 2002 showed unequal care between blacks and whites across everything, from breast cancer to cardiac care to pain management. As health professionals, we want to do right by our patients. The vast majority of us mean well, but we struggle on behalf of what we know, who we identify with, who we love. If there were more narratives of black women in the public sphere, would we have an easier time identifying with black women? Would we be able to see ourselves in black women? Would we push for a health system that ensures equal care for equal lives? If the health system saw June as fully human and fully alive, would her health outcome have been any different? As a medical student, watching June die from breast cancer, her incessant classroom question rang loudly in my head. Whose suffering matters less and why? I carry the example of June's life and death with me around the world. Since residency, I've split my time between San Francisco at the University of California, as well as health organizations in rural Rwanda and rural India. I witness so many people die from treatable diseases in those months. I watch mothers strap on their dead children and make that long walk home from causes as basic as dehydration. A certain anger arises in me as I see so many lives slip needlessly into the soil. The sun setting at night feels like the world turning its back daily. I remember Joseph, a 28-year-old Rwandan man with a mass the size of a grapefruit in the left side of his abdomen. His mother stood by his bedside for the entire month he was hospitalized. As he slipped into unresponsiveness, she shared tidbits of his life, his love for French football, and rap. We didn't have a great level of cancer gear then. But we had a good team of Rwandan doctors and nurses. We performed two biopsies without a clear diagnosis, struggled to treat him without knowing exactly what he had. There were so many logistical hurdles until he died. After he died, his mother took me aside. I wanted her to punch me in the stomach or scold me. Instead, she thanked me for our care. Her eyes were gentle and kind, deep brown like coffee with a touch of milk. Her hands were scathed the way land laborers' hands often are. I wondered who would tell the story of Joseph, make his life and his needless death visible, etch it into history in some small way. Returning from rural Rwanda, I wanted to do this. I wanted to carry the story of all the Josephs whose suffering seemed to matter that much less than that of my patients in San Francisco in the eyes of the world. I gave impassioned talks to medical students and public health students. In retrospect, I now realized how flawed my telling of Joseph's story was. In my skewed version, the history of the hospital always started when I arrived. I did not contextualize my arrival in a country that had endured colonialism, fought for independence, and struggled through its most recent challenges. I did not consider the very power and privilege of arriving in another person's country and being accepted immediately as a doctor. Invisible to me 
was the struggle for health care Rwandan colleagues had been engaged in long before I arrived and would continue long after I left. In my telling of Joseph's story, I became the protagonist. The audience identified with me. Unintentionally, I'd done the opposite of what I set out to do. I dropped Joseph of his own narrative. My telling, as one physician, I cannot carry the story of all the Josephs. My telling of Rwandan or rural Indian stories can only be complete if interwoven with robust, complex, and nuanced indigenous narratives. Without those voices, my lopsided retelling of other people's suffering can only summon pity, not justice. As Arundhati Roy, the Indian author, has said, there really is no such thing as the voiceless. There's only the deliberately silenced or the preferably unheard. Whose suffering matters less and why? Where we work in rural India, we see cholera and leprosy and tetanus. Half of the adult population is undernourished, like skeletons. 100 deaths from malaria doesn't even receive 10 lines in the national Indian newspaper. These deaths begin where power ends, where narratives end. Whose suffering matters less and why? This hit home most recently in the Ebola outbreak in 2014 in West Africa. Our team had worked in Liberia prior to the outbreak. In those early months, there were so few stories of the West African health professionals that had put their lives on the line for their patients. It was not until several months later, until the late summer of 2014, that Ebola became international news. It was not until the threat seemed to arrive on our shores did the urgency for an Ebola response become common sense. If Ebola had been identified in London or Boston, the international community would have acted quickly and proactively. There are other narratives for London and Boston that don't begin and end in fear. Other narratives that might ensure that we end up with justice instead of just pity. Whose suffering matters less and why? As a physician, I've worked in many health systems around the world, but I know from personal experience with my own father what good health care is capable of. When I was 16, my father came home from work in Los Angeles and collapsed on the tile floor. My mom screamed for me from the other room. As I came into the room, my father was face down. I went to turn him and his arm got stuck. I went to turn his arm and his head that I was balancing in my palm slipped and bounced off the tile floor. His eyes rolled back. I performed CPR. He would need a pacemaker after he quickly came to. Years before, his kidneys failed. He received a kidney transplant from his sister. With a pacemaker and a kidney transplant, my father continues to thrive to this day, continues to work as a physician to this day. I want this outcome, this possibility for every person on the planet, that every person may have their father live 30 years and counting because of available and quality Healthcare. Yes, we need so much. We need water and sanitations and vaccines, definitely. But we also need health care should our father require a kidney transplant or care should our brother have a mass the size of a grapefruit in his abdomen or care should our sister have breast cancer. Whether you're in San Francisco or rural Rwanda 
or rural India, we need equal care for equal lives anywhere on the planet. We are so far from that. Narrative equity can help us get there. Narrative equity means efforts to ensure that all people have equal access to create and tell their own story. My father and his narrative live on to this day, but the same cannot be said for Joseph and thousands of victims of Ebola in West Africa. Part of systemic change is seeing every human being as fully human, their stories, their lives, their histories. Needless deaths, deaths from treatable diseases start where narratives go unheard. If you are an individual that works in a community that's not your own, and you don't have to be a health professional, if you work in any community that is not your own, narrative equity means working long enough and humbly enough to allow for silenced voices to emerge. It means to work long enough and humbly enough to form an intimate human bond. It means to work long enough and humbly enough with the same community over so many years to understand the complexity of power and history in the question, whose suffering matters less and why? I co-founded an organization called the HEAL Initiative. At the HEAL Initiative, we attempt to marry health and narrative. We train frontline health professionals in some of the poorest parts of the planet. For us, narrative helps shape our health work. We teach ultrasound and malaria diagnosis, but we also emphasize narrative. Half of our 50 HEAL fellows are Native American or come from countries outside the United States. There are many metrics for our progress as an organization, but one of them is the deep connection of HEAL fellows across seven countries and every type of health professional. It means that we have started to at least partially counteract the isolation that many working in the most isolated parts of the world feel. As an organization, we are trying to fold silenced voices from Oakland and Navajo Nation and rural India into every level of leadership. In one of my favorite poems by my mentor and friend, June Jordan, she writes, and who will join the standing up? And the ones who stood without sweet company shall sing and sing back into the mountains and even, if necessary, under the sea. We are the ones we've been waiting for. May we join the standing up to ensure so many unheard narratives rise. In service of June and Joseph, and equal care for equal lives. And in doing so, may all of us collectively become the ones we've been waiting for. Thank you.